All right, hello everyone. Uh, welcome to the Debate Boutique Summer Programming for High School. We are so, 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 so excited to have you all uh, this summer and I wish I could be there in person. Uh, but as of now, I'm just happy that I get to give you all this lecture and you know, get to introduce you all to this wonderful topic that we have and get this program started. And really thank you all for participating. Uh, we really appreciate it. And we hope to give you the best summer experience possible. Now, with that being said, let's get into the topic lecture. So welcome to the water resources topic. My name is Caitlin Walrath. I am the chief, chief executive of operations for Debate Boutique LLC, and as well as an assistant debate coach for Wake Forest University. And I'm really excited to talk to you about today's topic. Uh, if it goes, there we go. Just to give you a roadmap briefly for the lecture uh, about, what, what, about what we'll be talking about today. First, I'll do an introduction of water resources. What are they? How are they allocated? And how do we understand uh, kind of what makes uh, water so important uh, to humans in the sense of regulatory and economic schema? And then the second, we'll have an overview of the Clean Water Act of 1972, which is considered one of the foundational pieces of legislation that helps guide uh, water protection in the United States, both for navigable water, as well as uh, things like uh, drinking water systems, which I will define later on, so it all makes sense. Then we'll get into an overview of the Safe Drinking Water Act of 1974, uh, which is also a basis of legislation for regulations for things like public health as well as contaminants in water uh, that is used for humans by uh, for drinking purposes and whatnot. And then we'll do a brief overview of some other environmental laws that uh, are important and kind of help influence the way uh, the uh, two previous laws, the Clean Water Act and the Safe Drinking Water Act uh, kind of uh, exist, how, they're, how those rules are promulgated, etc. And then finally, we'll kind of discuss where are we now? What is happening in our current situation? Uh, what is the situation with water? What issues exist? And kind of uh, give a broad overview of that. All right. So my slides go again. First, let's get into int the introduction of water resources. Let me move my camera over here so you all can see it. So uh, let's talk about water. So 70% of the Earth's surface is covered in it. However, the vast majority of the water that exists on Earth is oceans. That includes 97% of all water resources. And out of the remaining 3% that exist, 2% of that is groundwater and ice caps, glaciers, and inland seas. So everything uh, that is not like what we consider rivers, lakes, streams, et cetera. And out of that 2% that exists, 22% of, or sorry, out of that extra 3%, 22% of that 3% is ground water. And 77% of that is ice caps, glacier, and inland seas. So even the vast majority of the waters that are not uh, ocean waters are things that uh, are not really what we associate when we think uh, waters of the U.S., like rivers, streams, etc. And then in that remaining 3%, so we've got that 2% divided between groundwater, ice caps, etc. And then that last remaining 1% is all of the remaining water we think about. And out of that 1%, we have 61% of that 1% are lakes. So, you know, things like, you know, the Great Lakes, or, you know, you may have lakes near your home, et cetera. 39% of that are things like atmospheric and soil mo moisture. So the water that exists within things like the ground or the air at any given time. And then you may be thinking, Caitlin, wait, 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 61% plus 39%, isn't that already 100%? Well, just a couple percentage points, less than four tenths of a percent are our rivers. So rivers make up really the, va the vast minority of um, river or waters that exist uh, on earth. And so that's kind of the vast majority, the breakdown of all the water that exists. But out of all of that, out of all of that water that exists, only the following is usable or considered potable, which means it's drinkable by humans. So out of that, 0.61% of our water sources come from groundwater. 0.0009% of all the water is fresh water lakes that we can drink out of. 
and 0.0001% are those rivers that we can drink out of. So really, really a small percentage of all water that exists in the US, or, it, or sorry, rather on earth is usable by humans. What does that mean? It means that total usable earth, water on earth only counts for 0.62% of all water that exists. And out of that groundwater represents 98% of the available water for consumption. So in reality, groundwater sources are our largest source of, you know, survival uh, for water. And so given that, how are these resources are allocated? Well, groundwater, the biggest one, it's actually kind of really hard to get to because deep down in the earth trapped between uh, different layers of things like sediments, clays, uh, bedrock, etc. So really the only people who have access to groundwater are those who have the capacity to drill into it uh, within existing governmental regulations, uh, depending where you are in the area. However, what's distinct is surface water. And surface waters are referring to those streams, rivers, and lakes and things that I were was talking about earlier. And there's kind of two main doctrines that guide how these resources are allocated. The first is riparian rights. And it's when water is viewed as a common property resource, AKA it's owned equally by all who have access. So anyone who lives on like a lakefront or riverbed, whatever, they all, under repairing rights are have cons are considered to have equal access to water. And this was like the main doctrine uh, that was uh, governing water rights uh, before, uh, you know, the US government started uh, fully forming its own laws and whatever, because it was derived from English law. However, the second doctrine that guides policy prior appropriation is distinct in a couple different ways. It is distinct in the sense that water resources uh, who owns those is whoever draws water out of it first. They take precedent over any latecomers. And what that means is they can decide, hey, you know, I'll have other people be able to take water after me if they show up, but they don't just get, they won't get as much or whatever, or maybe they do get as the equal amount. It depends on what the person who uh, gets there first decides, or they may ban anyone from using that water resource. Um, and this is considered one of the more popular uh, forms of policy nowadays, especially when we get into things like buying property and buying things like river fronts, lake fronts, et cetera. Uh, and this uh, doctrine of policy derives from Spanish law, uh, which governed uh, most of the Western as well as uh, uh, Southern United States for a very long time before it formed as a nation because of Spanish colonization and whatnot. And so those two kind of doctrines determine uh, who has access to the waters in the United States. All right. And so that's kind of the history of water resources, how those things exist and all that good stuff. And so given all of that, what does it mean to legislate to protect water or what does it mean to be considering water resources something that are worthy of protection or legislating in the United States? And so this is where I'm going to start with the history of the Clean Water Act, um, because I believe it's kind of the cornerstone or the like primary commitment um, that the United States has shown as a governing force as well as a nation in committing itself to uh, protecting and monitoring waters of the United States. And so to start with the timeline that you kind of see at the top of the slide, I'll kind of go through each part. The first commitment to protect the integrity of waters began with the River and Harbors Act of 1899. And this act appropriated $75,000 in that time, which is a ton of money. It's worth about $2.4 million in 2021 adjusting for inflation. And that money was used to improve the navigation waters. So the waters used for things like commerce or, uh, you know, steamboat travel, moving humans, et cetera, uh, on the Ohio and Mississippi rear rivers uh, in that time. And so like they would do, they use the money to do things like remove sandbars, different snags and all other obstacles that exist in the rivers in order to make commerce as well as travel as easy as possible. And so following that, uh, then according to the EPA, the next major piece of legislation was the Federal Water Pollution Control Act of 1948. And this was the first major legislation to actually address growing water pollution because it was beginning to come to both public and governmental attention that uh, 
unregulated treatment or unregulated dumping of things like sewage or like different uh, contaminants from like agricultural practices or manufacturing, et cetera, may actually have impacts on human life. But no one took it uh, quite too far yet. So then in 1965, Congress uh, followed up the legislation from 1948 with the Water Quality Act um, that charged states uh, with setting the quality standards for interstate navigable waters. Um, and so the commitment towards cleaning up water, whatever, really only started taking flight in terms of making sure that waterways for commerce or travel were healthy so that, uh, you know, people who are using them most frequently would not get contaminated or like those things stayed safe uh, for the maintenance of the getting goods and whatever um, through the waters. And navigable waters, again, are just waters that the US has used historically or currently uses for interstate commerce or foreign commerce. Um, and these things are include, but are not limited to things like interstate waterways, interstate wetlands, because wetlands are the uh, buffer lands that lead into waters as well, or lead into things like rivers, lakes, et cetera, as well as our access to places like aquifers or other groundwater sources, and as well as interstate lakes, rivers, streams, so your other surface waters. However, the 60s were not the last time uh, the pollution issue was visited because awareness and concern for ever increasing water pollution uh, kind of led to a series of actions and a series of protests and kind of momentum building up in the United States to the point where like, Water was so dirty by 1970 that like two thirds of waterways could not, were not safe for either human consumption or human activity. So like people couldn't go swimming in them, whatever. And so because of all of that, um, and because that pollution is so bad because of things like untreated sewage and like fish dying or fish carrying toxins so people couldn't even fish, et cetera. In 1972, a series of amendments to the Federal Water Pollution Act, Control Act, so the act that was passed in 1948, uh, were passed. And they ended up changing the law so much that the name of the law, and it's considered a new act, uh, was passed. And this is the what is known as the Clean Water Act of 1972. And so these amendments... Uh, established kind of the core basis of what the Clean Water Act does and how we understand what regulation of water looks like in the US. So they did a couple things. Number one, they established a basic structure for regulated pollutant discharges into waters of the US or what I'm gonna refer to as WOTUS. Um, and what this means is uh, they were able to create a basic identification and list of contaminants and pollutants that may be in water, the standards for uh, how one monitors them or what the appropriate levels are in them and just like kind of ba other basic standards or understandings of the health impacts from those contaminants. The second thing these amendments did is it gave the Environmental Protection Agency or the EPA the authority to implement further pollution controls such as setting wastewater standards for different industries as they evolved, e.g. things like the oil industry or dairy agriculture or pharmaceuticals, whatever. Any industry that has an impact or relationship to water with its waste. Um, and then the, that empowers the EPA to make new rules and regulations to adapt to situations as they arise. The third thing these amendments did is they maintained existing requirements to set water quality standards for all contaminants in surface waters, um, which just basically meant that there is a standardized set of regulations that can be expected uh, that all bodies who regulate or monitor water resources will follow. Number four, these amendments made it unlawful for any person to discharge pollutants from a point source into navigable waters without a permit, and I'll define point source in a second. Number five, it funded the construction of sewage treatment plants with construction grants, which did not exist before, hence why the untreated sewage was being dumped, which was like a major uh, move towards safer waters as well as less contaminants. And then six, and finally, it recognized the problems uh, with, you know, current treatment of water, whatever, and attempted to address non-point source pollution as well, um, which I'm about to define. So 
The two different types of pollution I just mentioned, one is point source pollution. What I mean by that is pollution that comes from clearly identifiable points, such as things like pipes, wells, containers, concentrated animal feeding operations, boats, or other watercraft. Basically anything that uh, you're able to look to and understand where the contaminants are coming from. So these are the, I would, I want to say more easily monitored ones, but that's not true in all cases. But like in general, these are considered the more monitorable sources of pollution. And then the second source of pollution uh, is non-source or non-point source pollution. And what this means is it's pollution coming from diffuse, which means like spread out or non-identifiable um, or hard to identify points of discharge. And these are things such as like runoff from parking lots. So like, you know, when the rain comes down and the water rushes out into like rivers or groundwater, that's runoff. Uh, includes runoff from things like agriculture, lawns, gardens, construction, mining, logging, et cetera. Basically, it's just like, whenever you are doing something that has a toxin and water from the sky or water from other sources comes in, moves it, it's hard to identify exactly where um, those toxins came from. And so attempting to create regulatory structures for non-point uh, non source pollution uh, is much more difficult than point source pollution. After the Clean Water Act was established in 1972, that was not the last set of changes that were made um, to the act. Additional amendments were added in 1981. And this was because uh, these additional revisions helped streamline the construction grants for uh, sewage water treatments in cities, uh, which improved the capacity or the capabilities of treatment pits that were built. So basically just upgraded the standards uh, that were needed as well as uh, specified what the grants were more supposed to go to to ensure uh, the highest quality across the board. Then more changes occurred in 1987. Uh, which eventually phased out this grant program completely and replaced it with what is called the State Water Pollution Revolving Fund, or what is more commonly known as the Clean Water State Revolving Fund, which basically is a yearly fund which emphasizes the creation of EPA state partnerships and the need to grow them. So instead of just giving grants that are like, you know, this money is supposed to be used for X, instead the EPA directly works with state regulators or uh, the individuals who are monitoring and regulating these water systems and actively works with them in that money instead of just being like, do it for this thing. So it's a much more active partnership. Uh, other laws have passed besides amendments as well that have impacted uh, parts of the Clean Water Act over the years. I'm not gonna go over all of them just cause there's like so many, but like one example of something like this is Title I of the Great Lakes Critical Programs Act of 1990, which that part uh, put into place uh, certain parts of the Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement Act of 1978 which was an agreement between the US and Canada to reduce certain toxic pollutants from the Great Lakes. And basically what this title did is it required the EPA to establish new water criteria for 29 pollutants, including maximum levels that are safe for humans, wildlife, aquatic life, et cetera. So like basically a lot of these external laws that are not just direct amendments to the Clean Water Act are uh, calls to identify new sources of pollutants or calls to standardize them, study the health effects, et cetera. So they're just more trying to expand the scope and our understanding of what is a toxin or a pollutant within our environments. Um, the last part I kind of want to talk about here in the Clean Water Act is this idea that it in the Clean Water Act itself, the that states and the EPA are charged with regulating pollutants within the waters of the U.S. And so the definition, the term waters of the U.S. actually has been up for debate for a very long time, most heatedly throughout the 70s and 90s, and now reheating uh, in the later 2010s. And the reason for this is, is so initially when the Clean Water Act was passed, um, there was a long list of definitions of like, here's everything that are waters of the US. It included things like the navigable waters we've talked about, as well as different groundwater sources, as well as other surface water sources that aren't used for transportation, but that are used for other things. And this was in a bunch of other sources. 
And this was a really controversial definition because a bunch of people thought it was too broad and it would hurt industry overall, which would hamper the U.S.'s ability to grow. So instead of maintaining that definition, basically courts ruled for a very long time that there is no definition or you should only narrowly understand the waters of the U.S. as navigable waters, uh, which hampered a lot of regulatory efforts um, that were attempted. However, in the early 2000s, the Supreme Court of the United States held that the term must be defined uh, to hold the scope of the Clean Water Act more narrowly uh, in terms of like so that it's more clear where regulation should apply or not. However, no definition really ever concretely took place since that declaration. The closest we got was in 2015. The Obama administration uh, directed the EPA to release a definition, but that was met with so much opposition that when Trump came into office uh, in February of 2020, he ruled it back and basically was like, everyone continue operating as if this rule had never existed, operate as if you did prior to 2015. And so really, it's up in the air whether the Biden administration will follow in the Obama administration's steps and attempt to uh, replace this rule. He did announce in June, I believe, at June 9th it was, uh, that he does intend to define waters of the U.S., so that's something to keep in mind as this topic moves on. But yeah, anyways, that's kind of the overview of the Clean Water Act and everything like that. The next thing I would like to talk about is the overview of the Safe Drinking Water Act, the other kind of cornerstone legislation uh, in this whole process. So similar to like I did the Clean Water Act, We'll go through this timeline that's at the top, and then I'll talk about the basics of the act itself uh, when we get to it. All right, so the Safe Drinking Water Act uh, is meant to address the water that is potable or usable for humans, maintaining the health of those waterways such that the human population of the United States is able to consume it without getting sick. Like I said, it was a big issue back in the day, but yeah. So the first time that the U.S. decided to address drinking water governance was in 1912 um, with the passage of the U.S. Public Service Act, uh, which Congress used to prevent communicable diseases that were being introduced um, and transmitted through water. So an example of this that was very common on the tide uh, at the time was the waterborne typhoid um, disease that used to exist um, in water. It made a bunch of people very sick until because of this act, chlorination treatments um, from water treatment plants and sewage treatment plants started making their ways into the water plants, which ended up killing off um, the typhoid. So that's why we don't see people being sick all the time. Additionally, uh, this act uh, created federal oversight of interstate transport waters. Um, that then were launched into a bunch of different various phases throughout the decades following the 19 or following 1912 that helped limit microbes as well as other chemical or organic or radioactive materials from the water just to basically keep it as clean as possible. And because they were attempting to limit all those things, it eventually ended up creating and establishing the capacity for the federal government as well as other localities to monitor and test the nation's water supplies for the first time. Then, like as I mentioned in the same realm as the Clean Water Act, it was only the mounting concerns in the 1960s, as well as the eventual creation of the Environmental Protection Agency in 1970, that fully kind of created the momentum to take protecting water, drinking water seriously, or water in general seriously, beyond just, you know, kind of the attempt to limit some uh, compounds within uh, the waterways uh, and all that kind of stuff. And so because of that, in 1974, the Safe Drinking Water Act was passed. And the Safe Drinking Water Act does a couple things. One, it regulates the U.S.'s public drinking water supply in order to protect public health. Uh, and the agency that is authorized to set these national health-based standards and protect the supply is the Environmental Protection Agency. Uh, the act was amended twice first in 1986 and this amendment established that new the new established a couple things one a new primary drinking water standard that basically was higher quality than the one before two it expanded the contaminant list from the 23 from only 23 to 83 
Three, it required the EPA to publish a priority list of different contaminants or water sources to be addressed first in order to start triaging treatment. Fourth, or yeah, fourth, it established variance and exemption protocols for certain waterways or different things in order to protect industries slash make rules and regulation more flexible to uh, human growth needs. And finally, established two new groundwater programs. The programs were one, the Wellhead Protection Program, which required states, you know, the ones who implement all these regulations, to develop a program to prevent contamination of groundwater supplying public water systems. So the understanding that the vast majority of drinking water and usable water comes from groundwater. And then the second program was the Critical Aquifer Protection Program, which established a grant program to assist state and local units in protecting their sole source aquifers. So these are groundwater uh, sources. So aquifers exist under the ground. Um, that supply at least 50% of the water for those who are on the land directly above the aquifer. So the most famous of these is the Ogallala Aquifer that stretches throughout the Midwest and the Great Plain areas of the United States. So that's one that's regulated through this. The other amendment that existed to the Safe Drinking Water Act was a 1996 amendment. And this expanded the law's scope to emphasize the treatment, to emphasize treatment of water and water treatment plants as the primary means of achieving safe water. And in this, because it emphasized this, it recognized one, the need for capacity development. So the need to build more, to expand, to build more uh, treatment plants, to expand their capacity to monitor, to expand their capacity to remove pollutants, et cetera. Two, things like source water protection, so where we get our waters from. Three, operator training to make sure everyone, you know, is up to kit code and is able to effectively promulgate the regular, or to effectively enforce the regulations. Four, public information so that people are aware of what's happening with their waterways and they're able to comment publicly about how they believe the EPA or states are effectively protecting their drinking water. And then finally, increased funding for water system improvements across the board just to help ensure that water systems are healthy. However, one thing to note about the Safe Drinking Water Act is it only regulates public water systems, which a public water system is defined as a water system that provides piped water for human consumption for at least 60 days a year to at least 15 service connections, so, you know, either office buildings, homes, whatever, or 25 people. And so that baseline standard, everything that meets that criteria or is above it is public water. Any other system that does not meet that criteria is either classified as private or for other reasons are not subject to regulation. So we're really talking about a subset of all the water systems that are regulated by this act. Uh, and like the Clean Water Act, states are the primary force in charge of enforcing these EPA regulations. Currently, 49 states exercise this authority by controlling the Public Water Supply Supervision Program or the PWSS program. And thus, this program requires that states and territories, one, Adopt regulations as stringent as national requirements so it helps create a much more coordinated and less patchwork form of regulations across the US. Two, it helps develop procedures to purify water and monitor for contamination so that everyone kind of knows and is doing the same thing. Three, it assumes authority for any administrative penalties that may have come on board so that uh, it helps avoid water utilities from not being willing to invest in things like improvement or, you know, going public. Three, it helps conduct, or sorry, not three, four, it helps conduct inventories of purification and monitor system, monitoring systems to help make sure that uh, treatment plants are up to standard. Five, it maintains records and compliance data so that the EPA or any uh, monitoring force can kind of go back and review what is happening in water sources. Uh, seven, it 
or six. I forget the numbering. I'm going to stop the numbering. It also provides the e helps provide the Environmental Protection Agency with any reports that are required so that they can step in and do environmental statements. And then finally, helps construct plans for safe drinking water emergencies. So like, you know, if there is a crisis such as like lead contamination or whatever, what states or localities will do to address those things. And so each of these public water systems that is regulated under this whatever, they must also report all this monitoring data independently to states where states will do internal review or monitoring and then will report to the Environmental Protection Agency when there is a violation and whatnot. The number one violation and the like biggest uh, contaminant that um, not only is common in the news nowadays that we talk about as we see aging infrastructure as well as uh, crises of lack of uh, racial and if racial and economic inequality in terms of resource distribution and funding for cities is lead and lead and lead contamination in water is one item that across the board must be reported within 24 hours as it, it's an imminent threat at any consumption level because it's a neurotoxin. And if states and territories do not take immediate action, if a lead contaminant is identified, the EPA will is supposed to step in and they will resolve it. And so that's kind of what the Safe Drinking Water Act is primarily concerned with. All right, so that's our overview of that. The next thing I wanna talk about is the other environmental laws, which really there's only one um, that matters. And this is the National Environmental Policy Act of 1969. And this is why I mentioned this one and why I think it's important to have its own slide is it's generally considered the first comprehensive environmental legislation in the United States, as well as the cornerstone of all environmental law. Uh, it applies to almost all actions taken by or approved by federal agencies. It establishes broad goals for the nation for environmental health or environmental standards and helps uh, regulate or uh, guide any other actions under or any other policies uh, that it would impact the environment. And then finally, it sets the requirements for when agencies do take actions that they must meet before they do anything, which is called an environmental assessment. Every agency has to submit one before they take an action. If the environmental assessment comes back with a finding or a determination that that action will have a significant impact, then the agency has to do a full environmental impact statement, which is a much more longer and complicated process. And it also requires the company or, or the agency to put the action up for public comment, aka so that non-governmental actors can comment about their own opinions of what they believe uh, this action should be or whether or not it should be allowed. However, despite kind of all of that, this whole process really lacks teeth because courts have consistently ruled that this is the NEPA or the National Environmental Policy Act is only just a procedural statute, aka can only affect the process for how things go down but it, it is not a penalizing statute or uh, one that can allow uh, the EPA to take actions. So there's no required actions, diversion penalties or whatever uh, after an uh, environmental impact statement is conducted. It's really just to get the data to understand what the impacts are of everything. So yeah, that's NEPA. And so finally, what I really want to talk about is after all this review of laws, all this review of water resources, where are we now? Like, what are the problems? What should we talk about? And so broadly speaking, we can see a couple of different problems popping up in broad areas. So in coastal areas, we see we have problems with seawater intrusion. So because the more of the groundwater surface area or groundwaters or surface waters we use for human consumption or use for agricultural practice, whatever we use it for. As we drain those water resources, they just kind of leave empty caverns behind whatever, and those won't stay empty forever. And because you know, on coastal areas we're clearing them, seawater is able to fill them, um, which causes a whole bunch of issues, including uh, contamination of water sources. In continent area, continental areas, we see problems with this with land subsidence, subsidence, which is the idea when when you 
because like I said, remember, if we're draining water from places, you know, that are holding up clays, sediments, bedrock, whatever, when you drain that water out, there's just empty space there. And so the ground compresses because it doesn't want air in there, whatever. So land subsidence is when the ground starts to sink due to removing those layers of the earth, like water, et cetera. And that's more common in continental areas in the United States. And then in cities broadly, we're seeing a whole host of crises across the United States, including things like problems with water infrastructure where like pipes are exploding, they're not climatized, et cetera. Treatment processes are failing either because they don't identify enough contaminants or they're not doing enough to actually treat the water. And then just funding problems in general, the aging pipes that are leaching lead into different water sources across the United States, lack of climate protections that mean that like everything is crumbling and dying as we get more extreme weather procedures, and then contaminants from unregulated sources, things like pesticides, pharmaceuticals, fracking, construction, etc., all have massive environmental impacts, and they are not regulated by any of these, or they are only lightly regulated by the acts we've talked about, especially following the Trump presidency, where we exist in a major area of deregulation. So in reality, basically everywhere is suffering. Um, but, and so there is a massive need for move for protection of water resources and all that stuff. So that's why I think this topic is really good for everyone. But specifically speaking, I wanna highlight and identify a couple specific issues um, that exist across the United States. So the first is a city issue. So in places like Flint, Mix, Michigan or Jackson, Mississippi, we are seeing, uh, predominantly black and low income cities experiencing massive and prolonged water crisis from things like lead leaching into pipes, uh, into supplies, because there's been a consistent lack of funding on behalf of states, as well as the federal government, a consistent lack of regulation, as well as a consistent lack of care for these communities um, writ large. And so it is on us to demand better water for the people uh, in the United States, as well as peoples of the world, and kind of call into that. The second kind of issue are surface water issues. And so a lot of this is competition on how to fulfill the different populations water needs. And those needs are either fulfilled either by gathering from nearby lakes, streams, or rivers, or, or groundwater, or if none of those things are available, you have to move one drainage basin to another. This is what is called interbasin transfer. And this is what happens to create cities like Los Angeles or New York, et cetera. And so interbasin transfer is the diversion of surface water from one area to another to serve area users in that area. And this is done through a series systems of pipelines, reservoirs, canals, or aqueducts in order to like like literally like if you have a lake and that's like 200 miles away from the city you want to build you build a series of pipes or whatever to literally move that lake to wherever that city is so one of the biggest examples of this in the world or a modern example is the transfer of waters from the Catskill Mountains which are in upper state New York to the rest of New York which is almost 6 billion liters of water a day drained from the mountains to go to the rest of the state. So yeah, those are kind of the major problems we have. And then the last one I talked about a little bit earlier, which is land subsidence, uh, uh, which is when the ground sinks to removal layers of the earth. And I actually have some cool images for you all um, to give you an example of what this looks like. So the photo on the left, is discussing what happens when excessive groundwater extraction happens in places like the Western US where the vast majority of the soil and the ground uh, is an extensive mixture of clays and whatnot. So that when the groundwater uh, removes, it doesn't collapse flat fast because clays are kind of loose and flexible in the first place. So they kind of just sink, sink, sink slowly over time. And so what this picture on the left is showing you all about this fire hydrant is, I believe it was built in 1920. Uh, and that's where the ground was initially on the bottom. And this picture was taken in 1960 after 40 years of groundwater pumping had taken place for irrigation. And that's how much 
over pumping, how much extra water they removed from the ground um, that had never been removed before human use. So you can see it's a very dramatic change. You can literally see the earth move over years. And then the distinction is when you don't have a lot of clays or everything in the soil. So like in places like Florida or coastal areas, you'll get things like sinkholes, like this one that you can see near Ocala, Florida. And the cause of this is also the pumping of groundwater. But instead, when you pump the groundwater, instead of having all those clays that kind of nicely settle and smooth down, these uh, areas are primarily made of limestone. And they are these big underground limestone caves and whatnot that hold a bunch of fresh water. But when you pump the fresh water out, because they're near the ocean, seawater wants to rush in and fill those spaces. However, because seawater is chemically different from just normal water because it has a lot more salts in it, the way that those salts and the chemical interaction between the seawater and the limestone happens, the limestone slowly gets eroded away because um, the seawater is much harsher on it. And so then when you erode the limestone away, instead of what happens like the clay where it kind of settles nicely, it gets brittle and crinkly. And so over time, as it's getting eroded, eventually it snaps. And that's when you'll get these quick sinkholes where the ground literally just erodes and falls beneath you. And so we see a lot of these things happening. We see extreme weather events. We see all this environmental destruction. So really what I want to leave you on is where we are now is we really need some protection of water resources. And so with that, I'm, thank you all for joining me for the topic lecture. I'm really looking forward to meeting you all in person, and I'm excited for you all to begin investigating and exploring this question of now that we know we need to protect water resources, how exactly we do it. Thank you all so much, and I'm looking forward to working with you all the rest of the summer. See you all in a bit.